Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's colloquium. Um, our guest today is Michael Levin. Michael is the Vannevar Bush Distinguished Professor of Biology at Tufts Uni University and Associate Faculty at Harvard's Wyss Institute. Uh, he serves as the director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts and the co-director of the Institute for Computationally Designed Organisms at Tufts slash UVM. He's published over 400 peer-reviewed publications across developmental biology, computer science, and philosophy of mind. Dr. Levin received dual BS degrees in computer science and biology, followed by a PhD from Harvard. His graduate work on the molecular basis of left-right asymmetry was chosen by the journal Nature as a milestone in developmental biology in the last century. He did postdoctoral training at Harvard School of Medicine in cell biology and started his independent lab in 2000, developing the first molecular tools to read and write bioelectric patterns, pre patterns in non neural tissue. His group at Tufts works to understand information processing and problem solving across scales in a range of naturally evolved, synthetically engineered, and hybrid living systems. With that, over to you, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, let's see, uh, hopefully you can see my slides. So uh, if, if uh, anyone's interested in finding the primary papers, the data, the software, everything is at, uh, at this site here. So uh, what I'm going to try to transmit is a few main points. First, uh, our approach uh, in, at the intersection of uh, several disciplines that drives specific new discovery. So it's a way of thinking about agency, about uh, memory and things like that in a way that actually drives new capabilities. I'm going to talk about this notion of navigating arbitrary problem spaces and the idea of uh, that being an invariant that helps us to recognize, build, and communicate with some very unconventional agents in, in different embodiments. I'm going to use for the primary example of this, I'm going to use the collective intelligence of cells navigating anatomical morphous space. And I'm going to talk about how electrical networks in particular are a kind of protocognitive medium, which allows this collective to have uh, problem solving capacities in anatomical space. And this has many applications on biomedicine and also bioengineering. And at the end, I'll talk about some, uh, some synthetic uh, living uh, beings that, that we created as a way to uh, understand uh, to, to at least begin to understand where novel goals for these agents can come from. So uh, the first part of the talk uh, will be to um, set, set a kind of uh, philosophical foundation and, and to go over some examples that help us uh, stretch our thinking about some of these uh, topics. So this is a well-known painting. It's uh, Adam naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. And the thing about uh, the worldview that uh, supports this, this kind of uh, picture is that uh, all, all, the, all the animals here are quite discrete. So it's very obvious wh which one is Adam. It's very obvious that there's a, um, a discrete set of uh, other beings with different uh, properties. And uh, interestingly enough, and we'll get back to this at the end of the talk, according to this tradition, it was up to Adam to name the animals, actually not God, not the angels. It was actually Adam that had to assign them names or another way to say it is to uh, really understand their true nature. And I think that that, that part's right on the money. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Okay, so, so, so in this worldview, there are some discrete natural kinds here, but actually we've discovered then since uh, Darwin uh, showed us that actually this, this form here that, that most uh, thinking, let's say in philosophy and so on, says the, you know, the, human, uh, the human and the human mind and so on, is actually a, a single point on a, on a very rich uh, continuum going all the way back to single cells. And developmental biology shows us that actually this is true even on a single, uh, the, the scale of a single, a single animal, we all ar arise from one cell. And so there's this continuum, we're at the center of a, of a very, a very rich, um, smooth continuum of other forms. And some of which may, may have a two different degrees, the kind of uh, human level uh, agency, intelligence, and other properties that, uh, that we typically think of uh, as, as the, mo the modern human having. But it's actually even more interesting than that, because now with uh, both biotechnology and uh, all kinds of uh, engineering, we now see that there's a whole other axis here where we can now 
uh, start to make both, uh, both biological and technological hybrids, chimeras and various alterations, again, providing a whole new access to this continuum where it becomes really hard to say at what point you know, do you do you uh, lose or gain uh, certain properties that uh, we, we used to think it was quite obvious with what what humans had and animals didn't, and that's because at every level of organization we can now uh, mix in new new materials, new information, uh, new 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 policies, and, and and so on, and create all kinds of novel beings. So it becomes increasingly important to develop a framework, and this is one of the things that I work on, is to develop a framework that will allow us to simultaneously think about all sorts of unconventional agents. So beyond primates, birds, maybe an octopus or a whale, but, but also uh, we, weird colonial organisms, uh, swarms, synthetic new life forms that are engineered, uh, artificial intelligences, either purely software or uh, hardware robotics, and possibly someday even exobiological alien agents. And so the idea is that we need a framework that allows us to, to, to think about all of this. And I'm, of course, not the first person to suggest that. So here's Rosenbluth, Wiener, and Bigelow with a kind of cybernetic scale going all the way from passive matter all the way up to sort of human level metacognition up here. So they were trying to show how, how there, there really is a continuum of all these capacities. And, and what's important about this, this framework is that it has to move experimental work forward towards new capabilities. It can't just be philosophy. So... Um, I in 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 my in my framework, there's this there's this notion of a continuum of of persuadability, meaning focusing from an engineering perspective on what are the tools and approaches that one takes to modify what a system does. And you can imagine that along this continuum, and this is just four waypoints, uh, there are many very simple systems which you can only modify by by hardware rewiring. And then there are some cybernetic systems where you can change the set point and it will do something different, and you really don't have to know everything about how it works. You just have to know how to, how to rewrite that set point. And then you've got these other beings that have this marvelous interface that allows us to alter their set points without actually uh, digging in and physically changing them at all, meaning by experiences and stimuli. And this is why humans could train dogs and horses for thousands of years before we knew any neuroscience whatsoever, because they offer up this amazing interface that allows us to do that without this kind of rewiring. And then, of course, uh, you even even more complex systems where you can communicate with reasons and arguments. And so uh, the, the key is that when you're faced with a with a with a novel system, you really can't make assumptions about where it's going to be. Many people do. They have philosophical pre-commitments to where, let's say, cells and tissues would fit on here. Modern molecular medicine says, well, they've got to be somewhere up here. Uh, and and uh, we, we think it's an empirical question that actually needs to be answered by experiment. And so uh, this is this is what we do. So. Uh, so let's think about uh, where it is that uh, that that we actually uh, we actually come from. We originate as a single uh, unfertilized oocyte, this little quiescent cell, and that is the sort of thing about which people say, "Oh, that's just physics," and I, I, I kind of really dislike that term, but but it really is a piece of uh, a piece of uh, uh, chemistry, and uh, eventually through this incredibly. Uh, remarkable process of, of uh, development, we end up being one of these things, or even uh, or even something like this—a human that's going to make statements about not being a machine, and 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 so on. And what's important is that uh, the process is smooth and continuous. There is no place here that that developmental biology offers where you can draw a sharp line and say, ah, everything up till now was chemistry and physics, and then from here on you have mind. That that actually there, there is no spot like that. So so we have to go from systems that are pretty well described by basic chemistry and physics to ones that are uh, routinely dealt with by uh, psychological and other other kinds of um, techniques. So we have this one one complex issue that 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 we're sort of a, a, a the product of this slow um, gradual development, but at least we're a unified intelligence, right? I mean, we all feel like a a centralized uh, single being, and we think that uh, when people say the you know ant colonies and beehives are collective intelligences, well, maybe they're a kind of intelligence, but they're not like us. They're 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 a distributed kind of thing. It's not not real like 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 us, but in fact. Uh, if if we were to um, so so for example, uh, Descartes really liked the pineal gland because there's only one of them in the brain, and he felt that that was uh, really the seat of human consciousness because uh, the the unified feeling that we have really has to have only one uh, structural representation. But if he had had access to good microscopy, he would have looked inside the pineal gland and he would have seen that wow, there's not one of anything. Uh, it's made of of, uh, of of thousands upon thousands of cells. Each one of those cells has 
all of this stuff inside, right? So there really isn't one of anything. And so the fact is that we are all collective intelligences. We are all built of parts. And the research program that, that is suggested by this is to understand how those parts scale up to a, a larger, uh, larger emergent individual. So this is the kind of thing we're made of. We're made of an agential material, um, not, not passive matter, uh, not even active matter, but, but matter with agendas. And so this is a single cell. You can see, uh, well, there's no brain, there's no nervous system, uh, and yet it handles all of its physiological, anatomical, um, metabolic, and other needs at the scale of this single cell, quite competent. And in fact, uh, the fact, the 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 reality that that uh, our biology uses this 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 architecture means that we can even have really fascinating cases like this. So this is a caterpillar. Uh, it it's a soft-bodied kind of creature, so it has a particular controller made for a body with no hard elements. So there's nothing you can push on. Everything is sort of pneumatically operated, so to speak. And it has a brain suitable for driving that kind of body in a two-dimensional world of leaves. Uh, but it has to turn into this. It's a, it's a hard-bodied creature now that has to uh, live in a three-dimensional world and uh, drink nectar. No, it doesn't care about leaves. And so in order to change from here to there, all of the cells uh, are rearranging. Most of the brain is dissolved. The connections are broken. Most of the cells are, in fact, uh, killed off. And you, you build a new brain. But the remarkable thing is that the, uh, the moth or, caterpillar or, or butterfly still shows recall of memories that are formed in the caterpillar. So you can train the caterpillar and get, get memories um, recall out the other end. And so, so uh, it's, it's, it, we're starting to see that, that uh, not only can we have change on the sort of evolutionary scale, but even within the lifetime of an individual, radical changes to the body structure while some memories uh, remain. And so th this is, this is, uh, this is, um, gives rise to all kinds of interesting philosophical questions. You know, what's it like, again, ne never mind what's it like to be a butterfly, what's it like to be a caterpillar changing into a butterfly? Right? It makes the, the, the changes of human puberty seem just absolutely minor compared to this. And, and the ability to store information in this, in this robust medium that remains after the medium is refactored, uh, this is, this is a, uh, taken to its uh, complete conclusion. But in these animals, these are planaria, they have a true brain, uh, and you can train them to uh, expect food in this particular location with these little bumpy circles. And then you cut off their head and the tail sits there for about a week, doesn't do anything. It grows back a new brain. And when the new brain has grown back, you find out that they now spend their time looking for food at, these, at the correct location. It's called the place conditioning. And the rest of the body seems to store in some way that information and imprint it onto the new brain. And in fact, you can cut them into many pieces and then ask th thorny philosophical questions about which one is the original creature or maybe all of them. And so, and so this, this, this amazing uh, feedback between the plasticity of the body and, and, and the, the cognitive content is, uh, is, is fundamentally because we are built on a multi-scale competency architecture. Every layer uh, going all the way back through the body and the various organs and the tissues and the subcellular components and so on, uh, is it, not just structural, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's functional. It solves problems in various spaces. So there's, there's a competency at, at, at all levels. And we humans are okay at recognizing intelligence, but problem solving in and kind of medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds in three-dimensional space. That's our familiar, all our sense organs point out outwards that way. But, but if our sense organs, uh, if, imagine if we had a, a direct sense of our blood chemistry and we had some sort of a sensor inside that was able to give, I don't know, 20 different measurements of our, of our blood physiology. I think we'd have no problem having a direct perception of living in a 23-dimensional world where our liver and our kidneys were intelligent agents that navigate that physiological space on a daily basis. And so we deal with uh, uh, biological competencies in transcriptional space. So that is the space of possible gene expressions, uh, anatomical morphospace, which is what we'll spend most of uh, today talking about, and uh, the space of physiological states. All of these, all of these spaces have agents in them which, which strive and, uh, and, and solve problems and and succeed or fail, uh, much like the obvious ones do in uh, three-dimensional behavioral space. And so you can even think about evolution as pivoting some of the same tricks. And all of these tricks are around this notion of navigation, this, this sort of goal-directed navigation, um, pivot some of the same tricks 
through different spaces. So, so early life in metabolic space and then physiological space and eventually gene, the genes come along. And so now it's transcriptional space and then uh, morphology and multicellular organisms and then brains and muscles develop and you can do three-dimensional behavior and eventually uh, even linguistic navigation, right? So navigation, keep, keeping the thread of a, of a story or an argument through, through linguistic space. Okay, so we start to get an idea that uh, things are not so simple as, as, as Adam in the Garden of Eden. It's not just about three-dimensional space. It's not just about a fixed natural kind. Many things are extremely plastic and exhibit competencies in different spaces. And so uh, the, the, the bulk of today's talk, I wanna talk about one particular example of all of this, although we study many examples, but, but the one I wanna talk about is, a, is a, the agent that lives in anatomical morphospace, space. And that is a collective intelligence made of your body cells. Now, uh, it's interesting that um, uh, Alan Turing, of course, needs no introduction. He was very interested in uh, yeah, intelligence broadly conceived in, uh, in, in, in thinking, in machine substrates, so in fact, all kinds of substrates for computation and so on. So he was interested specifically in intelligence through plasticity or reprogrammability. But uh, one thing that um, is sometimes um, uh, uh, noted is that he actually also wrote this interesting paper about morphogenesis, about the, uh, the a model of, uh, of of order arising in, in well mixed chemical media for that uh, could be an um, kind of a, a, a an example of of how order can arise during embryonic development, and. Uh, you might wonder why somebody who is interested in computation and intelligence would be would be thinking about uh, the uh, the the um, origins of order in in chemical systems, and I think that's because he saw a very profound uh, symmetry between these two fields. The formation of the body and the formation of a mind are, I think, uh, very tightly linked. In fact, the same problem just in different spaces. And so we're going to talk about problem solving living machines and how reprogrammable they are. So let's think about what anatomical space uh, really looks like. Uh, here is a cross section of a human torso. You can see this amazing order, right? All the all this, the cell, the tissues, the organs, everything is in the right place, the right size, oriented correctly relative to each other. And uh, it comes from this, from a collection of embryonic blastomeres. This is how, this is how we start. Where is this pattern actually encoded, right? Uh, where, where is this pattern determined? Now, people will reflexively say, well, it's the DNA. It's, of course, it's in, the, it's in the genome. But we can read genomes now, and we know what's in the genome. What's in the genome are descriptions of the tiniest level hardware that every cell gets to have, the protein sequences. Uh, there's nothing directly about any of this in the genome. The genome doesn't have a blueprint of any of this. And so uh, what this then boils down to is the problem of asking about the software. How do... How do large numbers of cells given particular computational machinery end up building, working together to build something very specific. And this pattern is not in the genome any more than the structure of a termite nest or the shape of a particular spider web is in the genome of the termite or, or the spider. This all emerges from, from physiology. So we need to understand how cell groups know what to make and when to stop. Uh, as workers in regenerative medicine, we need to know if, if a part is missing, how do we convince the cells to rebuild it? And as engineers, we would like to also ask, uh, and this is the last part of my talk, we'd like to ask, what else is possible? Given the hardware that you have, what else could you build? Could the exact same cells build something completely different? And as we think about the end game of this field, well, you know, at what point did we consider ourselves done? Uh, I, I think of something we call the anatomical compiler. So the idea is that someday, you should be able to sit in front of a computer, draw the plant or animal that you want, or maybe an organ, or maybe some sort of biological robot, whatever shape you want. And the system, if we knew what we were doing, we would have a system that compiled this description down into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build exactly this. Uh, why do we want it? Well, in addition to sort of very basic uh, questions about evolution and cellular controls, this is the key to most problems in medicine. So, so if we had the ability to tell groups of cells what to build, we would uh, be done with birth defects, with traumatic injury, meaning we'd have regeneration, we could reprogram cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of these things would go away if we could communicate our goals to a set of uh, set of cells. And so, so this anatomical compiler fundamentally is not a 3D printer. It's not about putting, um, micromanaging the positions of cells where you want them. It's about communicating. It's a translator, really. It's about communicating your anatomical goals to the mechanisms guiding the set points of the cellular morphogenesis. 
Now, now, why don't we have this? And, and we have nowhere near that kind of capability. Now, why not? Molecular biology and genetics have been going gangbusters for, for decades. Why don't we have it? I'll give you a very simple example. Um, here's a, a baby axolotl. It's a salamander. The, the, the babies have little legs. Uh, here's a tadpole of a frog, Xenopus lavis. They do not uh, have legs in this stage. In my lab, we make a chimeric construct called a frogolotl. So we take a bunch of cells from, from uh, Xenopus and a bunch of cells from axolotl, and we make a frogolotl. Now, I ask a simple question. Uh, we have the genome of the axolotl. We have the genome of the frog. We have complete genetic sequence for both of these animals. Can anybody tell me whether the frogolotl is going to have legs or not? And the answer is no. We have absolutely no uh, formalism, no models that will make a prediction on this. And that's because this kind of thing is not a decision made at the level of uh, molecules or genes, and it's not made at the level of uh, individual cells. It is a collective decision, and we still do not have a good understanding of how collect cellular collectives make decisions. We're very good at manipulating information like this, which cells, which um, molecules talk to each other molecules, but we're a long way away from control of large scale form and function. And the reason I, I think is, is because molecular medicine is still stuck where uh, com where, where uh, uh, information technology was in the 40s and 50s. This is how you programmed a computer in the 40s and 50s. You physically had to rewire the machine. You were down at the hardware level. And this is where modern biology is. All the excitement is around DNA editing, uh, um, uh, pathway rewiring, protein engineering, uh, all, all of these things are directly, you know, single molecule approaches, all of these things are directly at the hardware level. And what, we've, what we're still leaving on the table is really the software of life, specifically the competencies, the, uh, the intelligence and the problem solving capacity of the material, which is very different than uh, all of the passive uh, matter that we've been engineering with for, uh, for millennia. So when I talk about intelligence, uh, I do not mean a human level metacognitive ability to know that you're smart and then to know what your goals are and so on. I mean something much more basic and fundamental. This is William James's definition. It's the ability to reach the same goal by different means. So what we have here is a continuum, and, and, and James actually talks about this, the, the continuum between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together. The difference being that these magnets, if separated by a, by a, a barrier, uh, are never going to go around and uh, meet each other because they don't have the ability for delayed gratification. They cannot go further away from their goal in order to later do, do better. Uh, Romeo and Juliet have all kinds of ability of planning and, and, and so on. And in between, you have lots of different uh, systems, uh, cells and animals and uh, autonomous vehicles and robotics and all, all kinds of stuff that has different degrees of competency to reach their goal when confronted by a barrier. So the idea is that uh, you have to force them to try to use different means. You can't do this from observational data. You have to do perturbative experiments to put a bar some, some, some kind of a, um, a problem between them and their goal. And then you have to see what level of competency they can muster. So, okay, so, so what kind of collective intelligence do we see in cellular swarms? Well, first of all, uh, so, so development is quite robust. It's quite reliable. And that's great. Most of the time, a normal uh, early embryo will become a normal, um, it will, will, will have a normal human morphology. But the amazing thing is that actually it's not hardwired because you can cut early embryos into pieces. You can cut them into halves, quarters, eights, and so on. And you don't get a half body. Each piece will give rise to perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And so if this is uh, anatomical morphous space boiled down to two axes, you can have this ensemble of states uh, associated with a normal human uh, target morphology, this goal state here, and you can get there from, from uh, fairly uh, d diverse starting positions, maybe avoiding some local minima along the way, but you still get there. So, so that's interesting. Development, uh, regulative development is able to get to the same goal uh, by different paths, okay? So different, different means to the same goal. This is not just for embryos. So some animals like the salamander can do it throughout its lifespan. So uh, amputate the arm anywhere along. In fact, they also regenerate their eyes, their jaws, their spinal cords, and so on. And, and you amputate anywhere here, and this thing will grow exactly what's needed, no more, no less, to give you a perfect uh, limb, and that's when they stop. So that's the most amazing thing about regeneration is that it knows when to stop. When does it stop? It stops when the correct salamander arm has been completed. So this is some sort of means ends analysis, right? It's a, some sort of error minimization scheme because it, the collective, no, no individual cell knows what a finger is or how many fingers you're supposed to have, but the collective absolutely does because if you deviate it from that state, it will do its best uh, to come back to where it needs to be 
and then it stops. By the way, this isn't just for worms and, and, uh, and amphibians. Uh, humans can do this uh, somewhat and mammals can, can do it. So, so, so we, we regenerate our livers, human children regenerate their fingertips and antlers um, in, a, in deer, which are a large adult mammal, grow back every year at a rate of a centimeter and a half of new bone. So, so this kind of ability is not just, uh, you know, it's not, it's not something that, that mammals couldn't do. And I want to give you another example because everything up until now has been about uh, external perturbation, so injury, but the, but the, and, and the ability of, of regulative morphogenesis to overcome injury. But there's actually an even more interesting example. So this is, this is a cross-section of, a, of a, a kidney tubule in the newt, and this was discovered back in the, in the 1940s. Uh, if you take a cross section, you see that the normal uh, lumen uh, is is within about eight to ten cells that work together to form this kind of tubule. What you can do here is uh, you can you can uh, make sure that the early uh, the early divisions end up with cells that have more genetic material than normal. So instead of two n, you can have a four n, five n, six n, and so on. So more genetic material. If you well, the first amazing thing is that if you do that, you still get a perfectly normal newt. So so you can have multiple copies of your genome. Apparently, that's fine. Then, whoops, uh, sorry, yeah, here we go. Then um, what, uh, what you find is that the cells actually get bigger to accommodate that genetic material, but the newt stays the same size. And this means that fewer of these larger cells uh, get together to form exactly the same lumen. So that's, that's kind of, that's also, also pretty amazing. The cells adjust their number to their size. And then the most remarkable thing of all, if you make truly gigantic cells, one single cell will bend around itself, leaving a space in the middle to give you that same lumen. What's, what's wild about that is that this is a different molecular mechanism. This is cytoskeletal bending. This is cell-to-cell -cell communication. And so that means that in the, it's, it's an example of a kind of um, top-down causation. In the, in the service of a large-scale anatomical goal, different molecular mechanisms are being called up to, uh, to execute. And just think about what that means uh, for a newt uh, coming into the world. Evolution had to produce not just a solution to a problem of a nude environment, but actually a problem solving machine, a second order kind of machine where you can't count on how, how, how much genetic material you're going to have and how many copies of each gene. You can't count on the size or the, the number of your cells. Uh, you can't you can't count on on uh, not being separated by you know by a, by a scientist uh, with, during embryonic development. Can't count on any of that. You have to be able to. Uh, to, to complete morphogenesis despite a wide range of not only external deviations, but, but changes in your own parts, right? I mean, we don't have anything remotely uh, like this in, in our technology that can, that can tolerate not only injury, but actually changes in its own composition and still get the job done. So this is what I mean by a kind of anatomical intelligence. It's a, it's a problem-solving capacity, which we still do not understand. And so the idea here is that uh, this, this process is not simply complexity. It's not just feed forward emergence. This idea that, and this is, this is what's in all the textbooks is that there are gene regulatory uh, networks. They make some proteins and then you get this process of emergence and complexity where simple rules get activated and eventually something complex happens. And, and here you go, you've got this structure. And, and of course, this is all, all this does occur. Right? There, are, there are many ways to get complexity out of simple rules, but there's something much more interesting here, which is that it's not just complexity. It's the fact that if you deviate the system from this particular outcome, uh, there are these loops that kick in both at the level of physics and genetics that will try to get you close back to where you were, navigate back to that region of, of, of morphospace, and in fact, take different paths and do different things to, uh, to, to, to get there. So it's not just a feed forward kind of system. Um, it, you might think about this as a kind of anatomical homeostasis. Now, uh, on the one hand, biologists know about all about feedback loops, and so, so, that's, so that's obvious, but, but there's some, some stuff that's quite different here. First of all, uh, typical feedback loops have a scalar as a set point. It's temperature or hunger level or pH or something like that, but um, that's not going to work. In this case, you need some sort of descriptor. Uh, it's a shape descriptor. It has to have more information to it than that, even if it's not down to the single cell level. Uh, but also, um, we're really not encouraged, especially in molecular biology, uh, we're really not encouraged to think about goals. We're not encouraged to think about processes that have an endpoint uh, that they are trying to reach. That's considered a sort of um, a unwelcome anthropomorphic talk. And we're really just supposed to think about emergence and how the low, how the simple rules will give rise to whatever it is that they give rise to. But I, I you know, since the forties, we've, we've, we've had cybernetics, um, 
so I think I think we can we can talk about systems with goals now that isn't magic and that's not scary and 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 what this what this does is make some very strong predictions. It predicts that if in fact if something like this is true and it has what every um, uh, homeostatic uh, system has to have, which is a which is a set a set point encoded somewhere, if it has some kind of biophysical uh, mechanism that encodes the set point, we should be able to do something interesting. We should be able to change the set point without rewiring the machine. So not make changes down here, which are actually extremely hard to know what to do, right? This process is not reversible. And so if you wanted to make a change up here, you, we, in, in general, we have no idea what to change down here. That's what's going to limit all the genetic editing, CRISPR, all that stuff is going to reach a ceiling after some uh, low hanging fruit of single gene diseases, because it's in general impossible to invert this. We have no idea what to change down here. But if we could change the set point, then, then maybe the system would just implement, do what it does best and implement that set, that set point. So this means that we should be able to find the encoding of the set point, we should be able to decode it, and we should be able to rewrite it, okay? And that's, that's what I'm going to show you now. Uh, but but um, interestingly, so, so we start to think about, okay, how, how is it possible that uh, cells and tissues store a memory, a pattern memory of what it is that they're trying to build? You know, how, how could that possibly work? Well, we have to note actually that in order to have memories about large scale um, states of affairs, you need a kind of cognitive glue that binds together the components. So uh, we have an example of this from neuroscience. So, so, so here's, a, here's an animal that learns to press the lever and get a delicious reward. Well, no individual cell has both experiences to form that uh, associative memory. So the cells at the bottoms of the feet interact with the lever, the, the cells in the gut are going to get this, uh, the sugar that comes from it. No, no cell has had both experiences. So, so who owns this associative memory? In order to own that associative memory, you have to bind all of these cells together into one uh, uh, collective agent that has memories, goals, preferences, and so on that none of the components do. And we know how this works. Uh, well, we don't know how it works, but we know, we know the architecture uh, in, in neuroscience and that's bioelectricity. So the thing that binds the neurons uh, in your nervous system together to make up an organism that has uh, goals and, and preferences in other spaces, it, uh, what we have is some hardware. And these are ion channels uh, that sit uh, on the outside of these neurons and they set a voltage gradient and that voltage gradient may or may not propagate to their neighbors. And so now you have a network, you have an excitable medium, and uh, it can do computation because information propagates in a, in a, in a very um, a complex and regulatable way uh, through that network. The software, it looks something like this. This is the physiology. So this group made this amazing video of a zebrafish uh, brain uh, active during, a, as the fish thinks about whatever it is that fish um, normally think about. And so, so there's this, uh, there's this uh, project of neural decoding, this idea that if we were to read out all of this physiology and decode it, then we would have access to direct access to the memories, the preferences, the um, uh, all of the uh, kinds of uh, cognitive content of this mind, right? That's the commitment of neuroscience is that all of that stuff is literally in the physiology here. But the amazing thing is actually that every cell in your body does this. So all cells have ion channels. Most of them have these electrical uh, connections to their neighbors. And, um, this, this is actually evolutionarily where the tricks of the brain come from. It comes from this much older system that was, uh, that was, that evolved around the time of bacterial biofilms actually. And so we started to wonder, could we not port all of the things that are important about neurons neuroscience, which is not the details of neurons, but the multi-scale cognitive scaling, uh, to try to do a kind of decoding on the collective intelligence of the body. Could we read and interpret this information and see what it's thinking about? And could we read out these goal states? And so the um, kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the mapping that, that, that I'm asking you to consider is, is, is this, that, that in the, the traditional uh, story is that in the brain, um, these electrical networks are giving commands to muscles to move your body through three-dimensional space. And all of this can be read out and analyzed. But that system comes from an older system, which otherwise works exactly the same. In fact, using the same mechanisms as well as the same algorithms, where uh, these electrical networks are giving commands to all of the cells to move your body through morphous space, the configuration of your body through morphous space. So as an embryo develops, as uh, regenerative organs uh, repair themselves, it's just an evolutionary pivot. Instead of working in three-dimensional space, you're working in anatomical morphous space. But the idea, and, and there's a different time scale, of course, right? You're not talking milliseconds, you're talking um, hours. 
but otherwise, otherwise it's a very similar thing. And so we've been able to import lots of different techniques from neuroscience. One thing we've developed is the first uh, use of voltage, uh, voltage reporting fluorescent dyes to uh, characterize all the electrical conversations that cells have with each other. So this is an early frog embryo. It is, uh, we, we are, we, this is a time lapse and we're watching the colors are, are, are giving us a map of the voltage. And you can see all the electrical conversations that are being had here. We do a lot of quantitative simulation to ask where do these patterns come from, knowing the channels and pumps that are expressed here. And then we have these, uh, we have these simulators that allow us to understand what the, uh, what the collective dynamics uh, are going to be once, uh, once the tissues have, uh, have uh, set up all these different states. I want to show you a couple of examples of these patterns. So the first example is what we call the electric face. So this is, again, a time lapse. This time it's grayscale, but it's a, it's a time lapse of a frog embryo putting its face together. And what you'll see is here's one frame out of that movie. What you'll see is that uh, at one point, there, you, can, you can read out a pre-pattern of where all the organs are going to go. So, so here's where the eye is going to be. Here's where the mouth is going to be. Here are the placodes. Uh, actually, the animal's uh, left eye comes in slightly later. And so, and so you can already see that long before the genes turn on and the anatomy of the face is nailed down, there is a, a, uh, an electrical pre-pattern that you can read that uh, shows that, that there is a, a representation of the thing it's aiming for. Now, uh, I'm showing you this one because it's, the, it's one of the easiest to decode. We have many others that we have not yet decoded, but this is pretty easy because it looks like the face. And so, and so I'll, I'll show you in a minute what happens when you, when you interfere with that pattern. But this is, a, this is a, uh, an endogenous pattern that is absolutely required to form a normal face because if you change any of these electrical states, the gene expression will change and the anatomy will change, right? So this is required for normal development. This, on the other hand, is a pathological pattern uh, induced by, uh, by injecting oncogenes into the embryo. They will eventually make a tumor, which metastasizes. But at early stages, you can see that what happens is the way you get tumors is these cells detach electrically from their neighbors. They acquire a different depolarized voltage potential. And at that point, uh, they're amoebas again, and they're uh, not connected to anything. And the rest of the body might, might as well just be external environment to them. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. So, okay, so, so these are imaging technologies, and this is how you can read the mind of the body. But uh, also really critical, you need to be able to rewrite it, right? So I promised you that we were going to be able to find the medium in which these set points are encoded. We were going to be able to read and translate them, and then we're going to be able to change them, rewrite them. And so, so how do we do that? We do not use any applied fields. There are no magnets. There are no electromagnetic waves. There are no frequencies. There are no electrodes, not, nothing like that. What we're doing is uh, modulating the native interface that cells expose to each other. This is how cells normally hack each other by exposing this this beautiful uh, uh, ion channel uh, keyboard, basically, which is a bunch of uh, different, uh, different ways to control the resting potential of any cell. And uh, we can now hijack this so we can open and close these channels. We can use drugs, we can use uh, optogenetics or light to open and close them. We can mutate some of these channels and the same thing for the gap junctions, right? So we have control of the topology and the electrical states of the network. So again, no electrodes, no applied fields of any kind, opening and closing the control machinery that normally processes this electrical information, okay? And, and, and this is all taken directly from neuroscience where people do this for synaptic plasticity and intrinsic plasticity. So now uh, I have to show you what happens when you do this, in other words, if, if I'm telling you that these bioelectrical states are not just a readout, but they're actually the set point towards that determine where in anatomical morphous space this collective agent is going to go. So remember my, my central claim is that uh, groups of cells are a kind of collective intelligence navigating anatomical morphous space. What binds them together and gives them the ability to reach goals despite uh, various uh, per, uh, perturbations is this electrical medium exactly like in the brain? So what happens when we when we change it? By the way, when when I, I was first doing this in 2000 or so, uh, what the standard expectation was that uh, well, voltage. What people said is that voltage is a housekeeping parameter. If you if you mess with it, you'll get uninterpretable uh, toxicity and death, and that not, nothing nothing would uh, nothing was po was was possible to do this way. I want to show you that 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 is not um, correct. So what we can do is, here's one example. I remember I showed you in that uh, electric face, there's one particular spot that was, is gonna be where the eye forms. And so we asked the simple question, could we reproduce that uh, voltage spot somewhere else? And uh, could we get some other region to think that it should make an eye? So the way we do that is we inject mRNA encoding a particular set of potassium channels. Um, 
we inject that, let's say here in a region that's normally going to be gut. And so here's this tadpole you see, there's the, there's the mouth, the nostrils, so the brain is up here, here are the eyes. And this whole thing is gut. And, and weirdly, it has an eye on its gut. Why? Because we injected uh, some ion channels that told this particular region to acquire a voltage, pat a voltage pattern, a pre-pattern memory of uh, that says build an eye here. So, and in fact, if you cut these eyes open, you'll see all the same lens, retina, optic nerve, all, all the stuff that they should have. So, so here are the, here are the uh, kind of um, important lessons from, from these, this set of experiments. First of all, the bioelectricity is instructive. It's not just toxicity. You can actually call up different organs. And in fact, if I had more time, I'd show you there are, there are many, many organs that you can call up this way. So that's first, it, de it determines what happens. It's not just an epiphenomenal readout. Second, it's extremely modular. Uh, like like uh, like any system with good competency, you don't micromanage it. You give it signals. All we said was we gave it a very low information content input. We just said make an eye here. Basically, we didn't give it all the information needed how to make an eye. We didn't talk to the stem cells and tell them where to go or or any of that. Uh, all we said was make an eye here, and then the system takes care of the rest. That that's a hallmark of a of a good uh, 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 a vertical architecture of competency. Uh, also, also uh, and, and another important note in the text in the developmental biology textbook, it will tell you that only the tissues up here in the anterior neurectoderm are competent to. That's a developmental biology term. Are competent to make eye, uh, and that's because people probed it with what they call the master eye gene called Pac6. And indeed, Pac6 only makes eyes up here. But uh, one of the things that uh, that I feel strongly about is that when when we make a claim of competency about any system. What we're really doing is taking an IQ test ourselves. All we're saying is that as an observer, this is what we figured out. Because it turns out that if you use a better, uh, better trigger, so bioelectrics instead of PAC6, in fact, any, any cell, we, we've, we've seen these eyes in every region of the body. All of them can make eyes, but you wouldn't know that if you didn't uh, uh, stimulate them with the right prompt, right? And I really think this is an example of bioprompting in the sense that, that, that people use this in machine learning. Uh, and, and finally, what, what I find super cool about this is that they also, uh, the system also has the ability to scale itself to the task. So, so this is a lens sitting out in the uh, uh, tail of a tadpole somewhere. These blue cells are the ones that we injected, but there's not enough of them to make a good lens. All these other cells are recruited by them even though we didn't touch them. So it's, it's, a second in, it's a second level instruction. We instruct these cells, make an eye. These cells instruct the others, hey, help us. There's not enough of us. All of you need to participate to make this eye. And we know uh, uh, many uh, collective intelligences which do exactly this. So for example, ants and termites, if a couple of scouts come across something that they can't lift, they will recruit a bunch of their neighbors. We already know this is something that collective intelligences are very good at scaling to. The, and, and we didn't have to tell the cells how to do that. This is all built in. This is the competency of the material material that, that we as engineers and evolution is dealing with. It's completely different from a, from a passive, um, a simple, simple machine. Um, we, we've, we've, we've been using the, these approaches, the, this, this, this idea of triggers, right, to uh, drive a regenerative medicine um, program. So, so here are frogs that normally do not regenerate their legs. So 45 days later after the amputation, there's nothing. We came up with a bioelectric cocktail that uh, immediately triggers after just, uh, just a day of, of uh, stimulation, it triggers a pro-regenerative blastema and then eventually a, a leg with some toes and here's a toenail and then eventually a very um, respectable leg with touch sensitivity and motility. So again, this idea that we don't micromanage, in fact, in our, in our uh, uh, most extreme example, 24 hour stimulation, followed by uh, 18 months of leg growth, during which time we don't touch it at all. Meaning that we're not trying to tell it how to build a leg. This is communicating right at the very beginning to the cells. This is the, you should go towards the, the leg building part of anatomical space, not the scarring. Okay. And so, so here I have to do a disclosure because um, Dave Kaplan and I uh, started this company, Morphoceuticals, which, whose, whose job it is to, um, and push all of this, this technology into mammals and hopefully eventually to humans using a combination of a wearable bioreactor, which uh, David's lab makes, uh, and the payload, uh, which we're trying to design to convince the cells that that's what they should be doing. So uh, what I want to do now is talk about planaria again to really reinforce the idea that these bioelectrical patterns are really pattern memories. They are the encoded set point of an anatomical homeostasis process in the, in the primitive yet competent mind of a collective intelligence of cells. And so, so, so the amazing thing about these, the, these animals is that they are really uh, robust regenerators. So you can cut them into many pieces. The record I think is 276, something like that. Um, they're also immortal. 
They also have an extremely noisy genome. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about that at the end, we can. This is, there's something really profound here. Why, why the animal with the, with the noisiest genome is the one that's immortal, cancer resistant, and incredibly regenerative. But we can talk about that at the end. But um, what we, we asked a simple question, which is when you, when you cut a planarian like this, so, so you cut off the head and the tail, here's the middle fragment. Um, how does this fragment know how many heads to have? Because reliably, 100% of the time, it makes one head, one tail. So it turns out there's an electrical circuit that we identified that actually controls how many heads you're supposed to have. And if you target that circuit, you can make these two-headed animals. So the way you do it is here is the, here is the bioelectrical pre-pattern of this, of this animal. And it says one head. And the molecular biology says one head. Here's the, here's the head marker. And sure enough, one head. What you can do is you can take this animal and rewrite this bioelectrical pattern. This is, this is still kind of messy. The technology is still very uh, in its infancy, but, but you, can, so you can do it. You can, you can uh, give it a pattern of two heads. And then this animal will uh, will in fact make a two-headed. Uh, I mean, this isn't Photoshop; these are real. These are real animals. And what's amazing is that this bioelectrical pattern is. So this is critical. This bioelectrical pattern is not a map of this animal. This is not a readout of a two-headed animal. This is a readout of this anatomically normal one-headed animal. The anatomy is normal. The gene expression is normal. The bioelectric pattern memory has been edited but nothing here has changed until you injure him. Once you do the injury, then these cells consult this pattern and produce what the pattern says. This is their reference point. They don't know any better. So of course, of course they're just gonna do this. They have no, the, the, the cells have no way of knowing that this is de de defective in any way. And so what I think is interesting here is that this is a really primitive uh, uh, counterfactual, right? So, so what one amazing thing about our brains is this ability of mental time travel that we can think about states that are not true right now, that either have been true in the past or might be true in the future, but they're not true right now. This is a counterfactual memory in the mind of the collective intelligence. This is not true right now. And, and, and that's fine. It deviates from the anatomy. A single body can store at least two different representations of what you are going to do in the future if you get injured, but you haven't yet been, right? And so, and so all of this can be, can be stored in one anatomically normal uh, body. So, so this is a, a kind of a simple counterfactual. And the reason I call it a memory is because if you ask what happens to these two-headed animals uh, once you start, once you recut them in plain water, no more manipulations. So you recut them. Uh, the traditional uh, approach would, says, well, the, you, you haven't touched the genome. The genetics are still a wild type. You cut off this crazy ectopic secondary head. You get rid of the primary head. Of course, it's going to go back to normal and give you a normal one-headed animal. That's the re th that, that way of thinking is the reason why two-headed worms were first seen in uh, 1903 or so. From 1903 to 2009, until we, we did it in 2009, nobody recut these two-headed worms. And that's because it was considered completely obvious what would happen. The genetics are normal. Of course, they'll go back to normal. But that, in fact, is not what happens. If you cut them, they continue to uh, be two-headed in perpetuity forever. This is why I call it, has, I call it a memory, because it has all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable. It's rewritable. And it has a conditional recall, which I just showed you. And it has two discrete behaviors. Here are some videos of these animals um, moving around. Uh, so, so uh, you know, th th this is one of those examples where we're, we're thinking about these things with a different framing. So not as a molecular biology machine that is going to do whatever the genome says, but as a uh, protocognitive kind of uh, agent that has to navigate morphospace space and whose memories could be rewritten, uh, gives you, it suggests new experiments that otherwise would not, well, in fact, had not been done. So, um, so, so, so we're doing a lot of uh, computational modeling to unify the picture of the bioelectrical circuit and its state space with some ideas in uh, connectionist uh, machine learning and, and um, dynamical systems to understand how these electrical networks can restore from partial inputs and store memories as attractors and all that kind of stuff. But interestingly, it's not just about head number. It turns out that um, it's also, it also controls head shape. So here's a nice triangular headed species. Uh, if you cut off that head and you confuse that bioelectrical network for a while, it takes about 48 hours, they will end up making flat heads like a P. felina or round heads like an S. mediterranea in addition to its normal head. So um, in fact, not only the head shape, but actually uh, the distribution of uh, the stem cells, the brain shape will be like these other species. These other species are between 100 and 150 million years distance from this guy. And so 
uh, in morphous space, there are lots of attractors. They're normally occupied by these particular species, but this hardware has no problem going there if the uh, if the electrical state says so. So they will visit these attractors, uh, and you can get you can get the exact you can get a different uh, a species anatomy by from from the same cells. In fact, you can go you can go further and really explore the latent morphous space, and you can make planaria this way that don't look like worms at all. They can they can have a different type of symmetry. They can be hybrid forms like this. They can be these crazy spiking things. No idea what that is, but but you can do all of this ge with genetically normal cells, and it's cool that humans aren't the only ones that know how to hack. Uh, these cells uh, to explore the latent morphous space of possibilities. In fact, uh, uh, it, it, other biology hacks each other all the time. And so this is a gall formed on an oak leaf by signals from a, uh, from a parasite, from a wasp embryo. And this thing is not made of wasp cells, it's made of leaf cells. So that, that wasp uh, has, has uh, produced some signals that hack these, the morphogenetic competencies of these cells and get it to build this we would have had absolutely no clue. We don't have anything in our arsenal yet that would allow us to look at the genome of the oak and the thing it normally makes and say that, well, most of the time it's flat and green, but you know, it's also capable of forming this, this, this round spherical red spiky thing. We have no ability to guess that. So, so this, this exploration of morphous space is a challenge for, for the coming decades, I think. In order to do this, what, what we're doing is trying to do a full stack uh, framework where you go from the expression of the different uh, hardware components. So channels and pumps, all the way up through uh, the, the physiological, multi-scale physiological dynamics, um, the organ level patterns, and then eventually a kind of uh, body-wide uh, algorithmic description of what's going on, right? And so, so, so full, full uh, integrative information so that you can actually read out human understandable rules at this end. And so, so looking at this and the idea that, that there, are, there are all these problem-solving competencies, there are memories, there's learning capacity, which I haven't even talked about, both at the molecular and at the cellular level, uh, suggests to us that there is a complement to this uh, conventional biomedical approach, which is all, all of these things are really bottom-up ways to try to force the hardware to, uh, to take, specific, take on specific states. But there's a wealth of techniques from, from behavioral science and from, other, from computer science and so on that uh, actually could uh, take advantage of, of, of some of the top-down controls that are possible to, to um, reach uh, states that, that are way too complex for us to micromanage. And all of that, uh, all of that is described here and the kind of implications for biomedicine. But, but the, all that is to, is to put out this, this uh, very controversial idea that I think the future of medicine is going to look less like chemistry and a lot more like a kind of somatic psychiatry. It's going to be all about communicating and resetting the goals of, of the cellular collectives and so on. So at the very, the, the very last thing I want to show you just for a couple of minutes is this. Um, we talked about these, uh, these kinds of uh, systems having various goals that they try to reach. And where do these goals come from? And typically, if you want to think about anatomical goals, such as target morphologies that embryos make, or uh, re repair to, or even physiological states, the typical answer is evolution. The goals come from, uh, they're set by evolution. So, so everything that had the goals that are not uh, fit in a particular environment has died out. And so now this is, this is what you have. So, so we want to we wanna, um, explore that idea. And, and the first thing that I'm going to show you is this important notion that the scale of goals can change radically, and not just on an evolutionary time scale, but um, on the time scale of a single individual. And this has real implications. Um, we, I, 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 I uh, use this concept of a cognitive light cone. The cognitive light cone, and this, this, I'm sure these diagrams will be familiar to you. They're sort of um, stolen from some of the specific physics uh, space-time diagrams, where what we can try to do is uh, try to imagine the size of the biggest goal that a given system can follow. So, so creatures like ticks, bacteria, and so on have little tiny goals. Everything they're doing is to is 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 to to, to keep us a, a tiny little region of of space-time in a particular physiological state. Some some creatures can have bigger goals, right? Your, your dog can certainly have some, some planning and some spatial awareness. It's never going to care about what happens three weeks from now, two towns over, right? So, so there's a limited um, cognitive light cone. And then humans actually can have extremely large cognitive light cones. There are people working towards world peace and what the financial markets are going to do a hundred years from now and so on. And then of course, is a key idea that we are composed of many agents cooperating and competing with each other that all have different sized uh, cognitive cones in different spaces. And so here's, here's how, here's the practical end of it. So biology, uh, it, it, during evolution, biology went from having little tiny goals 
to much bigger goals such as this. So all of these cells are a single agent pursuing this target in anatomical space and doing a very nice job of being able to reach it. So you have a scale up. So during evolution, you have, a, you have an inflation of this, this cognitive light cone. But that process has a failure mode. That failure mode is cancer. And so what happens is that when cells uh, uh, disconnect from, uh, from, from the electrical uh, network that allows them to remember these, these grandiose goals, they basically revert to being amoebas. And this is what I um, showed you a few minutes ago, that, that these cancer cells just uh, disconnect and, and treat the rest of the body as environment. They're not any more selfish. They're, they have smaller selves. So, so um, they, uh, they, it's, it's uh, so some, some game theory approaches model cancer cells as being fundamentally more selfish. I just think they have smaller selves. I think it's a, it's a, it's a shrinking of the boundary between self and world. And as far as they're concerned, the rest of the body um, is just external to them. But, um, but that, that weird way of thinking about cancer, which is, again, quite um, uh, un unconventional, uh, makes a strong prediction. It suggests that you don't have to kill cancer cells if you convince them to reconnect to the rest of the electrical uh, network, they will simply meld their tiny little uh, goals into the major um, goal of the collective and go back to making nice organs and so on. And that's exactly what, what we showed. So in the frog, if you inject an oncogene here, the, the oncoprotein is blazingly strong. It's in fact, it's all over the place, but there's no tumor. And there's no tumor because we co-injected an ion channel that forces these cells into electrical communication. Doesn't get rid of the genetic damage, doesn't kill the cells but they are now back as part of the network and doing what they're supposed to do, which is to make nice smooth muscle and skin and so on. And so again, you see this, 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 this idea of thinking about um, what a self is and how it sets boundaries between itself and the outside world and how co um, collectives scale their goals leads directly to a kind of uh, approach, of a, a biomedical approach, which we're now pushing all this into, into human cells, in particular glioblastoma. And, and this is a research, um, a, a biomedical research strategy. So the very last thing that uh, I want to point out is that in addition to that, uh, that cognitive light cone being able to change in, in, in our lifetime, so the, the, the size of the goals can change, but also where do these goals come from? And this is, this is work done with Josh Bongard's lab at UVM. Um, and uh, Douglas Blackiston is the, is the uh, biologist who, who did everything I'm about to show you. And, the, and, and again, I have to do a disclosure here because Josh and I have started a, a company around some of these ideas. Uh, we asked, um, what, what will cells do if they're, if they're liberated from their normal boundary conditions and, and asked to reboot their multicellularity? Uh, would, would, would they have different goals? And, and, uh, and if so, where do they come from? So here's, here's what we did. Very simple experiment. Uh, here's a frog embryo. Uh, this is a cross-section. You take a bunch of skin cells from up here and you put them in a little, in a little Petri dish. Now, uh, as you do this, so you've dissociated all these cells. So just a cloud of cells, they could do many things. They could die. They could move away from each other. They could do nothing. They could spread out like a two-dimensional monolayer. Instead, what they do is they form, they, they coalesce to form this amazing little thing, which we call a xenobot. Xenobot because Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog and it's a biorobotics platform. So we call it a xenobot. Um, they do a few things. First of all, they swim and they swim by little hairs that uh, they use to row against uh, the medium. Those hairs are normally used to redistribute mucus down the body of the frog, but, but, they're, but they've repurposed them to swim. They can go in circles. They can do this kind of patrolling thing back and forth. They have these group uh, collective uh, behaviors, lots of individuality. They have, they have very different um, uh, behavior patterns. Here's one navigating a maze. So, uh, so it goes down, it, fl it floats down here. At this point, it takes the corner without bumping into the opposite wall. So it takes the corner. And then at this point, it spontaneously turns around. So they have all kinds of spontaneous behaviors too, in addition to being able to react to features of the environment. Uh, if we do a kind of a calcium imaging, which uh, you would, um, uh, which, which is what people do to read brain activity, you see that they have all sorts of interesting signaling, which we're using uh, information theory now to, to ask uh, what, you know, whether they're talking to each other and so on. Uh, but there aren't any neurons here. This is just skin. That little creature you saw of, of, of navigating the maze and turning around whenever it feels like it, that, that, that's all skin. That's just skin. There is no nervous system there. And the most amazing thing they do, they, they do many things uh, that I don't have time to talk about, but the most amazing thing so far is what we call kinematic self-replication. So if you, you know, we've made it impossible for these guys to uh, replicate in the normal froggy fashion. They're just skin. They don't have any of those organs. So what we found is that if you give them skin cells, so the, this, this white stuff here are just loose skin cells sprinkled in the medium. If you give them skin cells, what they do is they run around and they collect them into little piles. And then they sort of polish these little piles and shape them. 
And those little piles, because they're because these bots are working with an agential material, just like we were when we made the bots, uh, the little piles mature into the next generation of Xenobots. And what do they do? They go around and they make the next generation and then the next generation. So this is a, a, an early form of von Neumann's dream. It's a, it's, a, it's a construct that goes around and makes copies of itself from materials it finds in the world around it. Uh, now, now, um, now, now, here's the thing. Uh, you can ask then, wh what, did the, what did evolution learn with the frog genome over time? Well, it certainly learned how to make these kinds of things. So this is the developmental stages, and then you get these tadpoles, but that's not all it learned. It can also do this, right? So this is a xenobot. This is an 80-day-old uh, xenobot. I have no idea what it's becoming, but it's got its own weird developmental trajectory. It has different behaviors, including kinematic self-replication, which has never existed before. There's never been evolutionary pressure to be a good xenobot. As far as we know, no other creature assembles by kinematic self-replication. It has all kinds of features that uh, there was never direct selection for any of those features. And so um, I think that what evolution is doing here is not just making simple single solutions to, sim to, to single environments. It's making problem-solving machines, which is hardware that's actually able to have uh, different kinds of problem-solving capacities and life histories depending on its environment. And so um, the fact that there's never been any xenobots and yet they have a very coherent uh, um, kind of way of life, uh, in, including expressing many new genes that in the, for normal frog embryos do not express and so on, tells us that, that there's the, the, the latent space around every genome is actually huge. It's not just the thing we see during normal embryonic development. And so the very last thing I'm going to say is this, Be because of this interoperability uh, be, because of life's ability to solve problems at every level and to really not take its not, not overtrain on its past history, it's very willing to to, to adopt new new ways of being. Uh, it's highly interoperable. This almost any combination of evolved material, designed material, and software is some kind of agent, and that's why we already have some of these. But but increasingly over the next decades. We're going to see cyborgs and hybrids and chimeras of various types and, and biological robots and all these kinds of things that when, when Darwin said endless forms most beautiful, right, for the for the mm, uh, a variety of, of living forms on Earth, all of that is just a tiny speck of this massive option space of new bodies and new minds that are possible and that are increasingly going to be with us in this world. And so this requires us to not only understand more about how individuals come to be and how cognition scales in the world and so on, but actually new, new forms of a, of a kind of um, ethical synthbiosis where you, where you can't use old criteria for for deciding how you're going to relate to all these novel creatures, right? Where you are on the evolutionary tree, what you're made of, did you come out of a factory? No, none of those things are going to be reliable guides to the new um, bodies and minds that are going to be around us. So this is this is really kind of um, going to touch, I think, every aspect of society ultimately. So uh, I will stop here and just say that if anybody wants to dig into any of this stuff, there are there are many papers uh, like this on our website. Most importantly, I want to thank the students and the postdocs who did all the work, okay? Um, lots of technical support uh, and uh, all of our uh, amazing collaborators. Uh, we have funding from a variety of, of, uh, of, of sources. Again, these disclosures, right? So here are the companies that have supported our work. And most of all, um, I thank the model systems because they really do all the hard work and all the heavy lifting. So thank you so much. And I will stop here and take any questions. All right. Thank you, Michael. That was really a fascinating talk. And we thank have so quite a few questions already. So cool. we'll jump right into them. Uh, the first question is from an anonymous attendee. Do you have any comments on plants and how this collective cellular intelligence plays into those sorts of organisms? Yeah, yeah, um, right. Uh, th there's a robust uh, uh, corner of uh, the field of diverse intelligence that works on plant cognition. So, so learning in plants, decision making in plants, memory, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think it's I think it's super interesting work. Uh, I think there is absolutely no problem. I mean, a lot of people get worked up about talking about plant intelligence. I think there's absolutely no problem uh, with. I, I think there are much more minimal systems that have degrees of. What, what is usefully called intelligence, meaning that we can apply tools from, from behavioral science to the much more primitive things than plants. So yeah, ab absolutely plants have aspects of this. Okay, very good. Um, next, uh, next question. Sorry, I'm losing track of where I am. They're bouncing around. Um, okay, uh, next question is again, an anonymous attendee. Uh, do you foresee a future where robotics and AI gets integrated with this research and relies on cellular bi biologies 
problem solving ability rather than the algorithms uh, specifically designed by humans. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, we have we could we, there's a there's a whole other um, talk I give on that on that topic. There are uh, there are some really uh, interesting uh, feedback loops between um, between biological intelligence and what has come out of recent research in, in machine learning. And in, in particular, we have some amazing examples of problem solving in the living world that we do not know how to duplicate in with, with any of our technology. So plants could solve very tricky um, inverse problems that we just have no clue how to, how to handle. And so uh, I do think that there's going to be a kind of a a bi-directional uh, 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 sy sy synergy between these two areas where the biology helps helps uh, the um, the machine learning we get to better algorithms, which in turn helps us leverage up the, the competencies of the living material. So I, I think it's a very exciting time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. You mentioned we don't know where this collective cellular intelligence comes from or how it works. What are the prevailing theories or hypotheses? Yeah, well, I, I I don't think I meant that we we don't know anything about how it works. I mean, I I we we actually are we we actually now know quite a bit about some of the key features. So uh, we could talk about exactly what happened. So so the the key thing, um, I'll I'll just give you one sim, sim, simple piece of it. Um, imagine that you're starting out with a little tiny. Uh, kind of a homeostatic uh, uh, agent where the cognitive light cone is very small. All it cares about is, is one, one local, local variable. And the goal is how do you uh, combine that into a network, which is able to now uh, store set points that are much bigger. They're bigger in terms of information content. They're, they're bigger in space and time, and they, they operate in other problem spaces and so on. So, so we, we have a, a bunch of computational modeling work showing um, what are at least some of the connection policies that are necessary and sufficient for that to happen. So in order to do that, there are some uh, memory wiping properties that you need. So for example, systems have to be connected in a way that makes it hard for each piece to know whether a particular memory belongs to it or to its neighbor, because that then wipes the individuality to the point where now this, 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 this collective goal directedness takes, uh, takes over. There are some interesting uh, pieces that have to do with stress propagation and the idea of stress sh uh, sharing such that, um, other 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 components stress becomes your stress and and so that in in an important way gives a kind of a collective identity to the system there's some other stuff so i mean th th those are the things that um that are that are that are beginning to be known so that's that's uh you know that that's that's not terribly mysterious at this point what what is completely open is the ability to predict specific goals. See, what, what, we, what we don't know right now at all is when we make a collective system and we make them all the time, so, so social structures, um, uh, political structures, uh, swarm robotics, you know, we make collective, collective uh, intelligences all the time. We have very little ability to predict what their competencies are going to be and what specific goals they are going to have. And so that's, that's really the problem. We, can, we, we, we understand a little bit of something about the scaling now, and although this is you know, wide open uh, uh, area of research, but being able to guess what it's going to want to do after you've made a collective system, I think is an existential level problem for humanity going forward. It's, it's, it's a really important science that we really need to develop. Okay, good. Uh, another anonymous question. Do you have any thoughts on the Tuatara, since they're ancient creatures with unusual DNA structure? Uh, I admit I have no idea what that is. I've never heard of it. <laughs> okay, maybe they can ask another question that is a little more explanatory. How, uh, how do you spell that? I'm going to, uh, is it on the... T-U-A-T-A-R-A. -A -A. It's oh. on uh, the q and I see. Yep, okay. I see it. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, that's something for me to look up. I've, I've never heard of it, so. Okay, I'm sure they'll insert something. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Dean. Your slide of injecting a tumor into an embryo showed clustering and isolation, while a true malignancy involves infiltrations without a clean border. Is this contrast and inconsistency, and is there a therapeutic opportunity? Um, yeah, to, to be to be clear, we did not inject the tumor. So so what we did was we induced a uh, we we injected a human oncogene into a, a few cells in the embryo. Mm -hmm. The first thing that cells do when they express these oncogenes 
uh, and, and it's an open question why they do that. We, we don't really know yet. But the first thing they do is they, um, they d disconnect electrically from their neighbors. That, that, that oncogene uh, prevents the cell from having good connections to its neighbors. As soon as it disconnects from its neighbors, it, uh, it, it, it does what any amoeba does in an environment. It overproliferates and it starts to migrate. And then some of them actually will, will try to come back and form some sort of, um, you know, they're trying for multicellularity. So they'll make a tumor, but it's not a good, you know, organ or anything like that. So um, th th there are many, many therapeutic opportunities here because uh, not, only, not only do they, uh, go off and have this, this metastatic behavior, but they actually convince some other cells to do the same, right? And, and so this is also seen in, in clinical cases, these cancer-associated fibroblasts and things like that. So there's, a, there's absolutely a, a, a clinical opportunity here to communicate with those cells and, uh, and give, A, reconnect them to their neighbors, but, but also, also give them the signals that they're expecting to hear from those neighbors that would lead them to, to, uh, to, to pursue anatomical goals instead of an amoeba-like lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Paul. Uh, he says, fascinating research. How far are we from applying some of the knowledge from your work to generating healthy cells uh, like a replacement liver or kidney or whatever? Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I, I try not to give time estimates because it's impossible to, 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 you know, to know exactly what's going to happen on the research side, on the funding side and so on. But I will say that uh, let's 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 put it this way. We've solved the leg regeneration problem in frog, which normally they don't regenerate their legs. We're moving this into mice now, and we have a company meaning that at least somebody believes that this is going to head for the FDA in in our lifetime. So the, that that's about as close as as, as I can get. I I, I expect to see uh, you know what I'm. 55. So take that for what it's worth. I, I expect to see in my lifetime, some of these approaches regenerating complete complex organs in patients. I, I think, I think it's going to happen. Well, that, that would be really uh, tremendous. Yeah. Um, next question is from Christopher. Uh, can we exert control of those decisions at the macroscopic level yet? Uh, for, for instance, to breed frog allotals and have some of them grow legs and some not grow legs from the same uh, genome. Well, let's see. Uh, there's a couple of a uh, couple of uh, pieces to that. So, so, so exerting control at the macroscopic level, uh, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, techniques that we have don't require us to have any uh, fine, let's say, cell level specificity to where we where we target. So, so we can do that. The um, the planaria, the two headed planaria, in fact. So the way the planaria reproduces, they tear themselves in half and each half regenerates. And now they have, now you get two worms that the two headed planaria, in fact, reproduce as, as two headed. So that is a permanent line of planaria and there's not a thing wrong with them genetically. So you can imagine if we, if we, if we we're not going to do this, but you can imagine if we took some of those two headed animals and threw them in the Charles river, nice. you know, a hundred years from now, some scientists would come along and, and scoop up some samples and say, Oh, look, a speciation event. Cool. Two headed animals and one headed animals. Let's sequence the genome and see what, see what the speciation event is and of course <laughs> there's nothing wrong with their genome so 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 we can already do this the frog uh i don't know if they will uh yeah i, I don't really expect the, the, that to breed true but the, but we will eventually have an answer to the the bigger thing is i mean nobody really fundamentally cares if frog will have one leg or two the key the, will have legs or not the key is that uh, I, I, we need a science of being able to predict such things and we don't have it. And all the molecular biology and the sequencing and the genomics in the world is not handling this. So, so we're, we're missing quite a bit here. Okay. And we have one more question uh, from Christopher. Uh, should matter in the body other than cells with DNA, uh, for example, water or iron content in the blood be considered part of the collective intelligence or as an external input or resource accessible to the members of the group intelligence. Yeah, very, very cool question. Um, here, here's here's what I would say. Uh, well, you know, one of the one of the important components of any intelligence is the various scratch pads that it uses to keep information. And many of those scratch pads are themselves not biotic. So, so cells can use the extracellular matrix as a kind of a stigmergy, right? To um, uh, um, 
deposit various molecules that they then pick up later. So a kind of memory medium, the way that ants use the surrounding uh, ground as a memory medium by putting down pheromones and so and so on. So yeah, I, th I think absolutely cells will use, I, I don't think cells care whether the stuff they uh, interact with is living or not. They will exploit anything in their environment to uh, to solve the problems that they have. And, and uh, uh, yes, I, I absolutely think there's a bunch of um, abiotic stuff, including bacteria, including water, which has interesting properties, min minerals, what, who knows what else that is, is part of the problem solving that cells are using. So yeah, I would think they're okay. part of it. And uh, this is a small follow-up question um, that he included. Uh, are dead skin cells and hair cells still part of the collective intelligence even after they're dead? Uh, I, I, well, there's two things there. So, so that would depend, and I don't know the answer, but it's a good research program that, that would depend on whether other cells are using the, the dead skin and hair cells for some kind of computation. And they may be, I, I don't know, but that's an empirical question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, but, but dead, dead is an interesting, um, kind of thing. There's a, there's a whole research program in the, in the um, project that I'm part of where, uh, we're trying to ask what it means. I mean, look, look at the look at the xenobots. Yeah, the the original frog that they came from is certainly dead. The it's gone. There is no frog. But the cells, none of the cells are dead. The cells are all alive. And in fact, the xenobots have a whole other lifestyle, and they live, you know, for however long they live. And so, dead is also not super easy to to define anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the last question here is more on to to Ataras. Uh, it says they're living fossil creatures whose bodies look much the same as they did in dinosaur times, hmm. but whose DNA evolves very rapidly. Interesting. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I will I will look it up. I, I've never okay. heard of it. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, that's it for the questions, and we're right at the time limit. So any final comments you wanted to make, Michael? Um, no, just thank you for listening. Great questions. Uh, I, pre I appreciate very much uh, your interest. And if anybody needs me, michael.levin at tufts.edu. I'm happy to hear from you. Okay, great. And thank you, Michael, for a really fascinating talk. Thank you and so much. Th yeah, thank, thank you, everyone, for attending today. And have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <music>